Good morning, everyone. So I think that conversation was not eight years ago, but something like 2003. Not to date you or anything, but it's been a while. And you did this Linux thing I just learned? Mm -hmm. Oh, OK, good. Uh, so my name is Dirk Hondel. Um, this is my hometown. It's, it's very rare to actually wake up in my own bed and then be able to go to a conference. I really appreciate that. We need to do more conferences in Portland. Who here is from Portland? <laughs> it's actually fewer people than I thought. Wow. OK. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> my hometown as well these days for the last 13 years. Um, I have to say, having a conference in Portland in February, I, at least it keeps the people inside, is what I say. Yeah. But. Well, we, we were in, in Tahoe last week, and, and Jim's yeah. joke was that there would be mudslides as drinks at the, in the evening reception. Did not go over well with all the mudslides <laughs> blocking people from going there. But OK, so normally when Linus and I go to a conference, one of the things that we do uh, traditionally is we go somewhere really exciting to go scuba diving and then go to a conference. This time, there wasn't an easy stop on the way to go scuba diving from our homes to here. But I think we're going up to Hoodsport in a couple of weeks, where the water temperature is going to be a very balmy 42 degrees. Yeah. And it's going to be awesome. I'm very much looking forward to this. Yeah. Um, this is the second year in a row that we're at ELC. Yeah, I don't know why. I avoided ELC for many years, and now we're doing it two years in a row. How did that happen? Uh, uh, I, I will not take any responsibility. So uh, let's start with some actual content. Um, 4.2, you released it on Sunday. 4.10. Uh, 4.10. Yeah. Did I say something else? Two. Oh, I, I read it binary, sorry. 4.10, you released it, <laughs> you released it uh, on Sunday. Highlights, lowlights, anything interesting? Um, 4 to 10 was fairly calm. 4 to 9 was our big release because Greg had made the mistake of telling everybody that 4.9 would be a long term re release, which always means that now uh, several companies decide, oh, we really need to hit this. So 4.9 was bigger than usual, and I expected 4.10 to be calmer. Uh, it wasn't, it was very average. Um, these days, it means that we change a lot of things, but there were no like big things that you need to like bring up. We had tons of new drivers. We had tons of, of updates to the core. Um, I always find it surprising that even now, like 25 plus years after, we still have updates to really core like including low-level assembly files for x86 that have been around forever. Uh, but it, there's, the whole process has been so smooth and normal for the last 10 years that, that we seldom have these huge peaks. We have a lot of work going on all over, but 4.10 did not have anything that specifically I'd like to shout out for. So you said um, that uh, Greg made a mistake pre-announcing that 4.9 would be a, a long-term supported yeah. kernel. Why do you think that's a mistake? Isn't it good to give people advanced warning, this is the one you want to aim for? So uh, Greg has actually been trying it both ways. And I'm not sure mistake is necessarily the wrong, uh, like the right thing to call it. Um, I'm actually happier with having releases that are purely time-based and are just regular. And then the, we pick, and, and Greg has done it that way several times too, that he just picks at them based on timing and often after the fact. And that just means that you don't have this situation where you have developers who feel pushed into hitting a particular release. And I think that's healthier. Mm -hmm. uh, it just means that we, we merge code when it's ready, and we don't have any other pressures. Uh, and, and it's been a very successful uh, model for us. Uh, and pre-announcing uh, LTS releases is, uh, kind of fights that. It's not so bad. I mean, realistically, 
Uh, it was bigger than usual, but we didn't have any huge issues. Um, I just like how our process has literally been about doing steady releases all the time. And then you have the stable trees after that, and then you pick one of the stable trees to be a long-term support release. And, and it's been, we've been doing this for 10 plus years, and it, it works really well. So I, I want to poke at this a little bit because there are a lot of, of groups, not just commercial companies, but a lot of groups who actually like the idea of knowing which stable, which kernel will be the long-term stable yep. one. So, and, and I remember that it was maybe a couple years ago, um, there was a lot of frustration that the feeling was that the people were tricked to thinking it was a different one and, and there were some hard feelings. So do we have any evidence in 4.9 that things got merged too, too early? So more patches after the fact or, or more stability issues after the release? It's too early to tell yet. I, I don't think, I, I think 4.9 is a fine release and I don't think it actually caused problems. Uh, I, I think our regular release schedule is so predictable now that people don't actually worry too much. And, uh, and there are people who care deeply about the long-term support yes. releases, but at the same time, those people also tend to have a uh, longer-term look on these releases in the first place, so they seldom have a lot of things that they want to get into this particular release. So you did, I, there was definitely some pressure, and 4.9 ended up being the biggest release we've ever done, uh, but, but at the same time, I don't think we, I'm not saying 4.9 is bad, I, I just say that I prefer the, the model where, where we don't have to worry about particular features at all and we just merge what's ready. So you announced this crazy idea 12 and a half years ago. Is it that long? Ju yeah. July 2004, I actually did my homework. Uh -huh. um, so yeah. literally half the history of our kernel. It has been this 10 week roughly revolving door of a new release and I mean, when we started this, I think we all in the room told you that you were batshit crazy. Yeah, I think no, there was consensus. That may have been the, the exact words. Yes, uh, yes, they were. Um, yeah, we've had. It's interesting. The kernel is a big project, and we've actually done a lot of things that that tried a lot of different approaches at, over the years. And every time we do something, it ends up pushing other projects to do the same thing, which I find interesting. We used to do the even odd thing, mm -hmm. which was a huge mistake, but it worked for several years where, where we would have even releases are stable releases and odd releases are the development releases. And we'd do that for like each release would effectively take, we were aiming for one year, but it would effectively take two to three years, yeah. which was very painful. But it became, inside the open source groups, a lot of other projects ended up uh, trying the same thing. And in fact, when we switched over 10 years ago to the new model where we do every releases every 10 weeks, it took years before people realized that, okay, 3.11 is not actually a development release. Uh, and 3.10 is not actually a stable release. They're all stable. Yeah. So we've, uh, we've tried a, a lot of different models, obviously also in source control management with Git. And, and the last 10 years have been really pleasant for me because uh, the process really has worked and we have not hit any pain, real pain points yet. Uh, and I say that because when you hit pain points in, in your release model, in your code flow, uh, that ends up being really painful. I, I mean, those, those have been the times when I have gone, this is not fun anymore, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, uh, and I like to say our current release schedule is almost boring, which is exactly what you want. You do not want your flow to be where, where people start trying exciting new things because that's really painful. It was interesting, we were both in, in Tahoe last week 
and before our, but before my presentation, uh, um, the Kubernetes guys were on stage, and they described their release model, which sounded very familiar. They have two weeks where you can commit features to this feature repository. After that, gets frozen, and then for ten weeks they develop on this. I'm like. I've heard that model before. Yeah, no, it, it really has been a very successful model, at least, at least as far as I can tell. I think, so I'm, I'm definitely in, in charge of the development side. Uh, so I have very little connection to companies and productization because after the development kernel, we have the stable kernel, then we have long-term releases, then we have the companies themselves doing their own releases on top of the long term. So I'm often at least two or three trees away from productization. But from what I can tell, even the product side really likes just this regular cadence of, of, of releases and knowing that whenever they do start something, they, they always have something that is not too old. And so it, it works both from a development standpoint, and it does seem to work very well from a, a productization standpoint, too. And now somebody can stand up and scream, no, you're wrong. This is horrible. Oh, that would be awesome. Anybody? No, no, no. Um, so, but, but you seem to indicate that this is all working well. So are people really still disciplined? Are people really uh, following the rules? Uh, merge window, and then after the merge window, it's only uh, fixes. No. Well, are we we, we're following the rules way better than we used to. I mean, the first five years, it really took five years for people to really understand that there were rules at all. Uh, <laughs> open source development is sometimes a bit like fussy. People, people do their own thing, and, and people have very strong opinions of how things should be done, so, so changing the, the whole model of development. It took a long time before people really got it. Uh, we're doing fairly well. Uh, one of the metrics people use to check how well we're actually following the, the merge window rules is, is looking after each release how much of the release was actually ready and in the so-called random next tree uh, before before the merge window open, and we're usually 90%. Mm -hmm. uh, so 85 to 95%, it depends a bit on release. And that's actually a fairly, I mean, that's clearly the bulk of it, but then there is that roughly 10%, uh, and a lot of that is bugs getting fixed, and that just happens, obviously, after things have been merged. But there have been, I mean, there are subsystems that I just say, guys, I will not pull, you can't follow the rules, uh, go away, right? Come back in two months when the merge window is open again, and then do this right, because this, you, you can't send me stuff in the late RC release that I have never seen before and that is not a fix. And, uh, and it still happens. And uh, sometimes I'm public about these outbursts, and sometimes, actually most of the time, I'm not. And just I tell people in private, guys, I'm not pulling this shit, because you can't follow these easy, simple rules. Uh, but on the whole, I mean, things work really well. Um, and, uh, and one of the advantages of the fairly short cycle is that even when people screw up, you don't have, I mean, when we used to have two to three years of release cycles, if you screwed up and you missed that window, you missed two to three years, right? And now, if you screw up and you can't follow the rules and I have to shout at you, you only lost two months, maybe. So it, it, it still happens, but, but it's, it's way better than it used to be. You can see it in a lot of other things. People have gotten used to Git. I used to every release, I used to have to really talk to people, and by talking I mean shouting, uh, about how their Git trees were rebased, how they had more merge commits than they had actual work because they were just merging from me every day during the middle of the merge window, taking random stuff that may or may not work. Don't do that. And I told people over and over and over again, and I don't think I need to anymore. I think people kind of, A, understand Git much better than they used to, 
but B, also the whole thing where, where the process has been working so well for so long that, that people kind of have learned what works and what does not work. So I take this to mean the process is going to stay around for a while longer. No I hope so. Coming. I hope so. Really, I mean, we've had, we've had serious disruptions in the process, and they've been very painful, and they've been good. I mean, don't get me wrong. They've been good looking back. But at the time, we've had so many very painful situations where, where people really hated each other's guts, and, and people walked away, and, and there was a huge amount of stress. Uh, even if our process right now is not perfect, I'm not going to say it's perfect, but it's, it's working. Uh, what, it, what having a stable process that people know how it works means that you don't have to worry about, okay, what will happen? Will I have to change the way I work? There's a lot of us that, okay, I'm not going to say we're autistic because we're not, but people <laughs> end up being very... Uh, set in their ways. Like you have, you have, you may be great at coding, but it's very annoying when things change around you and you have to jump through hoops and you have to learn new things to do. And, and we do have a, a lot of people who are I'm borderline OCD and, and, and really, having a process that works makes everybody so much happier. I, I think I'll change topics here. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that I always find interesting, especially when we are in embedded events, um, security and the Linux kernel and specifically the insane size of the attack surface mm -hmm. that Linux offers. And of course, I mean, uh, Chips are getting, getting bigger and bigger, so the size isn't as critical anymore in the does it fit, but I think it still is very critical in the attack surface. Uh, do you think that Linux really is the right kernel for IoT? I think it depends on what you're doing. I mean, if you're doing a, a small sensor thing at the end point, Linux may not be the right thing. I'm almost certain that if you're doing these small sensors that are battery operated and they're, they're doing one thing, they're sensing temperature, humidity, whatever, and, and they're just phoning back to a local box gateway. that then, gateway that then actually does the real work. I understand that you, maybe you want to use Linux even in the sensor for other reasons, but, but that's where, where Linux is certainly questionable. But then once you get the, to the gateway or anything that actually talks to the internet, once you hit networking, mm -hmm. um, things get much more complicated. And at that point, you probably do want a real operating system. And, and I obviously think that Linux is the real operating system to peak. I, I, <laughs> right. I, I had a great conversation with, with a, a, an expert in the area of, of secure and reliable operating systems. And he was convinced that we should start from scratch using Rust and C++ for the outer layers and create a secure design. I know what a huge C++ fan, fan you are. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I believe I maintain the only open source project to which Linus has sent C++ changes. Commits written in C++. I'm very proud of that. But mm -hmm. um, <laughs> what do you, what do you th <laughs> I don't think so. What, what do you think of, of the idea of creating something in a, a domain-specific language designed around security to create a more robust uh, kernel for the edge, for the, for the network-facing devices? Uh, I think domain-specific languages and having something that is clearly more designed towards security than C is a great thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think those languages tend to be all that great at system programming. Mm -hmm. uh, it's doable in small niches, but, and that's not where Linux is going. So if you want to do a niche thing, go wild. Uh, the whole point of Linux is to be general purpose, that you can use it across a very wide variety of, of devices and, and use models. 
And, uh, and there is clearly a certain di dichotomy between generic and security. You're always going to be more secure by making your device or service more specific and less capable. There's no question about that. And Linux is not interested in more specific and less capable. Uh, at the same time, we've certainly seen more specific and less capable also be a complete disaster from a security standpoint. I, I think in the end, even a secure language will not help you when you have people who are rushing to get some random small consumer device out the door. And then you'll just make the security mistakes on a higher levels in your protocols and in your uh, lack of encryption and in your updating models and, and all oh, these details. Off. So I, I think you do have a huge advantage in Linux in the fact that you have a lot of different people in a lot of different areas that do actually care about security. I don't think security is an absolute. And if you care about security, and you clearly should in this environment, you want to have multiple levels of, and layers of security. And the kernel will never be perfect. Don't get me wrong. The kernel is big. It's complicated. In, in the embedded world, you can limit that by compiling away as much of it as you can. But even then, you'll never be perfect. Do a security shell around it. Do a security shell around that. Make sure that you don't accept any random connections. And then the embedded people still put their own back doors because they want to debug things. So <laughs> I'm sure you've seen the same stories as I have, right? Yeah. So, so security is, is never going to be perfect. Uh, anybody who tells you that they aim for perfect security, stop talking to them. They're morons. Don't, don't even bother. Uh, the people you want to talk to are the people who mitigate security issues and, and admit up front that nothing is ever perfect. And, and in this kind of crowd, one of the mitigations need to be able to, to do upgrades, secure updates over the network. Don't depend on consumers doing them for you, because they won't. Uh, and don't make your upgrade process an attack surface, which is the other common mistake. But make sure they can happen at every single level. And then you'll still end up having security issues with the hardware not being secure. And somebody comes up with a really clever scheme to actually attack the hardware itself. And at that point, you just admit, OK, there is no perfect security. Next generation will do better. Yeah. And and you, you need to make sure that you're resilient to some extent and, and have multiple layers of defense. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's go back a little bit more to Linux. Today, we have 32 main platforms in the kernel tree. And if you... No, 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 no. We may have 32 architectures. I would not call them main platforms, because some of them are very, very random. Right? <laughs> My next question was going to be, um, are they all maintained? Tested, working, useful? Realistically, I think all of them are useful to somebody. Uh, there are people who enjoy tinkering. And, uh, but yeah, no, a lot of them are, are really just toys and, and are a an testament to how portable the kernel is, mm -hmm. that you can actually create a new architecture in support in not very much code. If you have a GCC port to your architecture, you can literally do a Linux port to it in like a couple of thousand lines of code. It won't be maybe a completely full capable system, but it will work. Uh, but the end result of that is we do, of the 30 plus architectures we support, four or five are actually real and meaningful and something you should actually think of using in a, in a production settings. Oh, now I'll get you in trouble. So which four or five are those? <laughs> Just from a maintenance angle, I'd say x86, ARM, PowerPC, and S390 seem to be the ones that get 
reliably maintained. I might have missed something. I mean, if, if I forgot one or two, uh, don't, don't think that, that your architecture is not worthy. Uh, <laughs> but, but on the whole, those four are the ones that, that I call out as being both actively maintained and, and in good shape. Uh, and by ARM, I mean both 32 and 64 bit. I don't, uh, same for x86. Uh, the rest tend to be sporadic. So, in those four architectures, are there interesting innovations? Are there new things that you're excited about? I mean, this morning I, I read about AMD's Ryzen platform that will revolutionize the world, which I kind of doubt. But, are there innovations where you say, oh, I can't wait for this to be available in public, or is this all boring <coughs> today? Uh, realistically, most architectures are pretty much the same. I mean, the ISAs differ, but they all do the same things. Um, there are a few things coming up. Um, I'm very happy about, for example, PowerPC seems to be finally getting rid of the hashed page tables that I always hated with a passion, and they have a ra radix tree. So, that's somebody. Can we close the doors, please? <laughs> uh, and that's a very welcome thing, just because their memory management uh, will be so much better. Um, it's it's still early days for that, but I enjoy seeing those kinds of improvements. On x86, we're actually. It's funny. We used to, I mean, so the kernel obviously used to be x86 only, and, uh, and the original paging model for x86 was the two-level page tree that, uh, the tables that, that the original 386 had. And we expanded that from two to three because alpha had, had a bigger virtual address space. Then we expanded it from three to four, and now we're on the cusp of expanding it from four to five. And the previous ones were fairly painful Going from 4 to 5, it looks like it will be, it might even happen 4.11, probably 4.12. It's 20 patches, and they're not even that big. And I'm impressed by how we can now, I mean, partly because we've done this several times before, we can now just add a new level of paging, and it doesn't even look like a big deal anymore. Uh, so we, we do have core functionality coming to core architectures. Uh, at the same time, one of the issues we have is, is we still support uh, processors from 20 years ago. We finally did drop support for the 386 and uh, because realistically, it, you cannot make a safe, uh, operating system on a 386 because uh, the page faults don't work right on that. Uh, but, but we still support chips that are 20 years old and, and that don't have certain features. So we still support chips that do not have the don't execute bit, which is coming back to the security issue. That's a security issue. If you don't have no execute bit, you are going to be open to a lot of attacks that Chip, modern chips aren't even open to. Um, so, so some of the issues we always have are about compatibility and supporting chips that are not as good as what you can get today and what you can get tomorrow. So as someone who follows your active social media life, I've noticed quite a few posts on models that you're building, whether it's RC cars or little uh. dragons or whatnot. Are we seeing a shift from Linus, the software developer, to Linus, the hardware tinkerer? No, no, I've done hardware, and, and the, they always end up not working that well. Uh, no, I, I, I grew up doing plastic models, and one of the effects of the current roughly 10-week release window is that right now I'm in my really busy time, and I sit in front of the computer 12 hours a day, in five weeks, I'm expecting and hoping to be in the situation where I'm mo mostly just waiting around for bug reports and fixes, right? So I can do most of, most of my time. I do end up 
checking email, but I need to check email once an hour, and most of those hours, not a lot of ha has happened. So I started building models while I'm waiting for that to happen. Some people like watching TV. That doesn't do it for me. I tinker with these tiny models instead, and that, that was good for last release. And here I hope that you would announce the big project number four, the Linus Maker Kit. No, no, no. no. Okay. I... Then I guess our time is up. Thank you very much, Linus. Thank you.